Hello, you bloody Anglophonians. Well, did you know that there was a story written by Ian Fleming called James Bond in New York? Well, yeah, really. Uh, there was one who was doing this earlier, and it was Colonel Clifton. So today, let's take a look at the story Clifton in New York. Well, the James Bond story I was referring to is actually called 007 in New York and is actually just a vehicle for describing the city and presenting Ian Fleming's favorite drinks and food. The story is even rounded off by a recipe, scrambled eggs a la James Bond. Well, let's see what Colonel Clifton is up to in New York. The story begins with a coup in the South American country of San Mirador. The dictator General Poncho was violently deposed and had to flee the country. So he came to Mexico, from where he is on his way to New York by plane. General Poncho is of course not particularly happy about the coup and is already making loud plans for his return to San Mirador. Another passenger feels disturbed by the general's emotional outbursts and asks for silence whereupon the general threatens him with his saber. Once in New York, however, Poncho realizes that the man he threatened is not just anyone. It is the famous singer and actor Pinchot Barnett, for whom there is a large train station hosted at the airport. What? 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 Hold, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Who translated that? Google Translate? Holding a large train station is a German phrase that means giving someone a great welcome, having a big celebration for welcoming him. It has nothing to do with a train station in itself, it's just a metaphor. You can't translate that literally. But okay, well, a pincher barnet is celebrated by a crowd at the airport, while ex-dictator General Poncho is ignored. Poncho even has to walk into town from the airport passing dozens of billboards displaying some products that Pincher Barnett either advertises or even is a part of. Poncho wants to start a counter-revolution in San Mirador, but he needs money to do that. Unfortunately, the New York underworld is of no help to him. But when he and his bodyguards come across a poster from Pincher Barnett, the general comes up with an idea. Why not kidnap the famous singer and actor? and extort a million dollar ransom. The action is indeed successful. His bodyguards disguise themselves as women, break into Barnett's dressing room and kidnap him. Barnett's manager John W. Gaylord is desperate and turns to the police. But the police officer thinks the whole thing is a PR gag and refuses to investigate. That's why Gaylord flies to London to consult the famous detective Harold Wilberforce Clifton. Although Clifton hates Barnett's music, he agrees to come to New York and look for the missing actor. In fact, during the phone call to discuss the ransom delivery, he manages to get the name of the hotel where Barnett is being held from the kidnapper himself. Clifton goes there immediately, while the kidnappers pack their things and look for a new hiding place. Clifton follows their trail. The story does not shed a good light on the New York police who refuse to conduct an investigation. However, that should not correspond to reality. If someone reports a kidnapping to the police, they have to investigate, whether it is considered a PR stunt or not. But that's the way how Machero brings Clifton into the story. The structure of the story is also interesting because, like the first case, it takes a relatively long time for Clifton to really show up. Machero takes the time to build the story so that Clifton can eventually step in and resolve the matter. Again, it's a very straightforward story, Clifton chasing the kidnappers to find their hiding place. Unfortunately, Machereau uses the same trick again to move the plot forward. In the first case, the criminals accidentally damaged Clifton's car so that he furiously followed them and accidentally ended up in their hiding place. 
In this case, Clifton loses track of the kidnappers and calls a taxi. In this taxi, he sits on one of the medals belonging to General Poncho. The taxi driver still remembers where he took the general and his helpers and Clifton continues to investigate. Even in 1960, it is a great coincidence that Clifton chooses the one taxi that General Poncho used from among the many taxis there are in New York. In addition, the story is told with more slapstick. From the beginning, in the airplane, to the airport and the city and all that happens to General Poncho, to the time where Clifton steps in right up to the part in which the New York police do not recognize the kidnapped actor Pinscher Barnett. Of course, there are a few allusions to the differences between civilized England and the uncultivated USA. And speaking of England... Barnett's manager's name is Gaylord. This is a regular name, both as first and last name. Originally from French, the basic word guy or gay in English has changed in meaning over the years. In addition to the original meanings full of joy and full of happiness from the 12th century and shiny and striking from the 13th century, the general connotation of sexuality and immorality emerged from 1637 onwards. For example, if someone spoke of a gay house in the 1890s, he meant a brothel. Gaylord and the French Gaillard also had the connotation dandy. In this area, there are indications of a not always exclusive but intended meaning in the direction of homosexual from 1880 and intensified from 1920, primarily in the USA. Here it also had a euphemistic function due to its double meaning. The Oxford English Dictionary gives the year 1951 as the first finding for a clear meaning of homosexual. In 1963, this meaning was well known that Albert Ellis used it in the book The Intelligent Woman's Guide to Manhunting. It first appeared as a noun in 1971. Gaylord was among the 700 most popular first names in the United States from 1900 to 1940 and this then fell rapidly. The use of the name Gaylord in the meaning of well, Gay Lord is first recorded in the 1970s. Did the Belgian Machereau know the double meaning of the syllable gay and the intentions that would come with a name like Gay Lord in 1960? Probably not. If you look at the Clifton stories, you can see that they are full of very British sounding names. The more crazy, the better. And no real Britain does it under two or three first names in these stories. Majerot was only concerned with creating a contrast between the quintessentially American actor Pinscher Barnett and his British manager John W. Gaylord. So there's that. Clifton in New York is an excitingly written chase, even if I personally miss the scientific research that Clifton carried out in the first case. So there you have it. The ongoing story of our British, a very British hero. We will see more of him at another time. So, see you then. Bye.